This is Paul McGuire. We take the lens of God's Word, and specifically God's prophetic Word, but all of God's Word, Genesis to Revelation, and we analyze what's happening in terms of current events. We look at what's going on in our nation, the state that you live in, the community you live in, the home, the family, the single life, or whatever. We look at it through the lens or the perspective or the worldview, a biblical worldview, and then we conduct an analysis of documentation, facts, scientific truths. We scrutinize, we reject scientific mythologies, we reject uh, medical research mythologies, and we are on a hunt, a quest for the truth. Why? Because the truth sets you free. Jesus Christ said, and Jesus Christ is not just an historical figure. Jesus Christ is not just a spiritual teacher. Jesus Christ is not just, you know, a guru. Jesus Christ is not a guru uh, in a long list of funky gurus, you know, like the guru who went up to Oregon and had, I don't know, you know, dozens of whatever it was, Rolls Royces, okay? Not, not that kind of guru. Uh, many gurus rip people off. They know how to use occultic powers for the purpose of hypnotic programming and mind control. You know, I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but the reason so many people are spiritually deceived, politically deceived, emotionally deceived, and by that I mean people in their interpersonal relationships, when people, quote, fall in love, to use a, a popular expression, when people have a romantic relationship or whatever, or any kind of interpersonal human-to-human -human relationship, you open yourself up. That creates a space or an environment for intimacy, because we as human beings, especially in the Western culture, but this is also true in cultures, uh, just about every culture uh, throughout the world, um, people are guarded about what's really going on inside of them emotionally. They, they don't want to open up and um, be vulnerable. Being vulnerable means that potentially, potentially somebody could take advantage of you. Uh, they could exploit your weaknesses. Now, those aren't really weaknesses. That's your humanity. But we live, as, as the Bible says, in a fallen world. And that simply means that this world we live in on planet Earth, spaceship Earth, as Buckminster Fuller coined the term, uh, spaceship Earth <clears throat> is a fragile planet. And I'm not talking about in terms of climate change or things like that. I'm talking about it's a fragile planet for humanity. Because you see, when planet Earth was first created, uh, planet Earth had a designer. They don't want you to know that in the educational system. They, they, you know, you can call it whatever you want to call it, and that's fine. You know, people, people, some people are addicted to their spiritual darkness. You understand what I'm saying? It's a lot of people in America. The big addiction problem is bigger than uh, an opioid epidemic or uh, alcoholism or those are all very important things because they they create a biochemical, spiritual, psychological, uh, um, neurological dependence on a chemical substance that changes your biochemistry. And so when you take this chemical substance, you hear a lot of people say stuff like, after taking uh, cocaine or whatever, they say, this is the first time I've ever felt normal. This is the first time I ever felt like myself. Now, now, why are they saying that? Well, a common answer, a common response from our collective dysfunctional culture is to shame those people, 
put them down, look down upon them, use words like uh, disparaging words like, oh, you're a loser or whatever. That, that, that's a lot of nonsense, you know, because you see some of the most astute people, some of the most perceptive people, some of the most intelligent, creative, genius type people also have a flip side. They have, they have a childlikeness. I'm not saying they're immature, don't get me wrong, but they have a childlike quality. And what did Jesus Christ say? See, Jesus Christ, he wasn't about rejecting people over superficials. That's not who Jesus Christ was, and that's not who he is. Jesus Christ didn't go around rejecting people, shaming people, calling people names. He didn't do that. Why? Because God is love. Jesus Christ is love. Whenever Jesus Christ encountered anyone, except for those individuals who, through an act of their will, repeatedly, after being offered numerous chances, hardened their hearts against God, who is love, and determined with an act of their will that they would carry out <clears throat> psychic, psychological violence, cruelty, exploitation, and the degrading of their fellow man or woman. Jesus never did that. Religious people did that. Political systems have done that for centuries in order to enslave and to subjugate people, divide and conquer. You look at America right now, especially America, what do you see? Is, is the real problem in America right now uh, racism? Is that the real problem? Because if it is, we need to focus all our efforts into solving racism so we can bring healing. Every one of us wants to see an end to the, to the, to, to the riots, the protests, the burning of stores, the looting, the, the shooting. Every one of us wants to see an end to police um, uh, killing demonstrators or whatever. But it, but it goes two ways. That is happening. I'm not here to give you a percentage. I don't have a percentage, but it's obvious. You can see it on television. But, of course, television is an illusion. It depends how you edit what you videotape. I learned that. You know, I, I was a film major at the uh, uh, University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. I was a dual, my dual major at the University of Missouri was filmmaking. And uh, uh, it was also in the field of psychology. I specialized in, yes, it was a legitimate study at the University of Missouri. <clears throat> uh, I majored in the brand new field at the time called Altered States of Consciousness, which fell under the umbrella of the University of Missouri Psychology Department. And the one thing you realize is that all of us, uh, as human beings, we have a state of consciousness. What is a state of consciousness? It's just a complicated word to say your emotional, your psychological, your biochemical, your resonant frequency. Now, what do I mean by resonant frequency? Every one of us as human beings generates a specific frequency that nobody else has. Um, our frequency that every one of us generates is as unique to us as our fingerprint, our thumbprint, etc. And so when we walk around uh, anywhere, if somebody has the right kind of electronic equipment, <clears throat> they can tune in and find us anywhere on planet Earth via satellite, via other technologies, because in a sense, you and I are like an AM or FM uh, uh, broadcasting station to use kind of like old technology. But we also uh, emanate at a broader frequency range than simply an AM signal or an FM signal. We broadcast a unique frequency that's as unique as our fingerprints, our thumbprints, or our biometric ID. 
And so you could, you could with an electronic scanning device, <clears throat> uh, scan through, uh, you know, millions of people and with artificial intelligence and, and a, a, a supercomputer, you could locate a specific individual if you knew what their EMF electromagnetic frequency was. And so Albert Einstein and many other scientists said, everything you see in this reality is based on the generation of EMF and electromagnetic frequency. So each one of us is always uh, sending out a vibrational signal um, that is a precise frequency. It's just like, you know, in the old days or whatever, when you were driving around in your car and you go back, this is probably before many of your uh, personal biographical history, but once upon a time, there was no FM radio. When I was a kid and things first started out, there was only AM. So, for example, when I uh, uh, hosted a nationally syndicated radio show, three hours to four hours a day, drive time, Monday through Friday, and the program would re-air on Saturday and Sunday, and it would often re-air on different stations twice a day. So I would be on six hours live. Uh, for, I would be on, for example, in the state of California. That means every little hamlet, town, city, uh, anywhere you would go in the state of California, Northern California, Southern California, um, the Paul McGuire show would broadcast on two powerful AM stations of a particular frequency. One covered all of Northern California and went up to, uh, I think, Oregon. And the other, KBRT, uh, many of you are former listeners of, of KBRT AM740, a, a great radio station under the Crawford Broadcasting Network. And uh, I continue to have enormous respect uh, for Mr. Donald Crawford, the president and owner of Crawford Broadcasting. So when you drove around anywhere in Southern California and the signal would go way out into the ocean and it would go way down in Southern Mexico, um, the frequency on the AM dial was 740. That was the specific frequency. And I think, I can't remember the, the, the station number or the frequency of the Northern California station. Uh, I think it was 770 a.m., I think. And then, of course, we were on major markets all across the United States, like the state of Colorado and many other states. So, But you could only hear the program. You could only hear my voice. You could only hear the commercials and other programs by tuning into a particular frequency. Now, this uh, the Crawford Broadcasting Company uh, owned... Uh, uh, a vast network of AM and FM stations. So in some markets, we were on AM and FM. Some we were on AM, um, but it would vary. And between the two, it blanketed the United States of America, basically. And then, of course, when the Internet became available, the, the show went AM, FM, and then it went all over the Internet, all over the world. So the key was finding the, the, the right frequency to, to get that particular program. Now, that was a Christian uh, radio station, and I was proud to be a, quote, Christian radio talk show host. It was a three- to four-hour daily drive-time um, show, uh, and the blessing for me and and the blessing in terms of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ in, an, an, in a captivating manner. And, and, and the, the joy for me was the fact that um, everybody in California, Northern California or Southern California, was stuck in traffic. The, the joke is, but it isn't a joke, and that is that, um, like the 405 freeway in Southern California, if you've ever driven on it, it's called the largest parking lot in the world <laughs> because it's hardly a freeway. You could crawl faster on the pavement 
on most days, then you'd be better off crawling to work than, than driving in this endless parking lot. And so I believe God ordained that. No, God's not sadistic. He wasn't trying to torture people by putting them in endless traffic jams. But you see, when when you're living in, um, when your anchor station, which was KBRT AM 740, you're in California, <clears throat> you just turned it 740, it's still broadcasting. It's a powerhouse station, as is, uh, as are all of the Crawford stations. And um, people were being ministered to, people were accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, people who had backslidden were coming back to Christ by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, uh, because they were, they were a captive audience. They were stuck in traffic. So they couldn't get home in 15 minutes or 30 minutes. They would sometimes get home two hours each way. So this was before uh, so many of the technologies that we're all used to now. They were just in their very early seed stage. So basically, you were stuck in your car in a traffic jam, and you had two choices back then. Cell phones were just beginning to come on board, okay? But they were very pricey. So cell phones couldn't command your attention, and they didn't have all the uh, electronic devices to play music and satellite. Today, you have so many other options in your car. Well, back then, there were no options. You had AM or FM. And so that means, by the grace of God, I had a captive audience of, cap of countless millions of people because they were stuck in traffic. And that was the Lord, because um, I, by the grace of God, had more time with the millions of people listening uh, throughout the state of California and other states, I was able to spend more time with them. That means ministering to them from the Word of God in an entertaining manner and, and teaching them, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they, they, they ha were stuck in traffic, and so they became addicted to, uh, they got, the, the audience was, got bored with some of the big conservative talk show hosts. Not that the, the, they weren't good, they were good, but people used to call my show all the time, and to, to my surprise, this is before Michael Savage was censored all across the nation, people would constantly call the Paul McGuire show, uh, a Christian talk show, and they would say, uh, my two favorite shows on the radio are Michael Savage and you, Paul McGuire, and the Paul McGuire Show. So we began stealing, it's competition, right? It's capitalism. We began stealing uh, the audience, the audience for Savage and many of the other big shows were now tuning into the Paul McGuire Show. Why, why, why? Because you can only take so much conservative politics, but hey, that's fine, but conservative politics can't save your soul. See? Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. At that time, too, this is going back quite a few years, Howard Stern uh, was on lots of AM and FM stations. So he was part of our competition. And as those of you who remember, Howard Stern basically did a, a quote, shock jock porno uh, uh, porno radio show, and his content was pornographic, and I'm not going to go into it, but it was high. It, it was super sexually explicit, and there were other people who were competitors of Stearns that were even more sexually explicit. It was so bad, I won't even tell you what was happening on the radio. Anyway, we began to get uh, a, a tidal wave of listeners from people who were disenfranchised from these other stations. In fact, I would get calls on my Christian radio show, but my Christian radio show wasn't boring. See, number one rule in communication, don't bore your audience. So people would call up and say, literally, I, I, used, I used to listen to Howard Stern 
I don't listen to Howard Stern anymore. I listen to the Paul McGuire show. Why? Because we did shows on sexuality, and, and we didn't beat around the bush. But our goal was not to be lewd and pornographic. So the bottom line here is God set this thing up so that on two powerhouse stations, we covered every square inch of the state of California. And that meant we had a massive audience, and then many of the stations we were on, after they would play the full three hours for the Paul McGuire show, or the full uh, full four hours, uh, there would be a a new set of commuters stuck in traffic, and they would listen to all the stations play a replay. So the Paul McGuire show was on like six hours a day. And there's one other thing I want to mention to this, and that is, you know, Jesus Christ said, you judge a tree by its fruit. So, um, you know, we had presidents of the United States as our guests on the show, the prime minister of Israel, uh, big time generals from Israel and, you know, all kinds of people and eclectic guests. I mean, movie stars and rock and roll stars would call and their wives would call. And to my surprise, uh, when you do talk radio, by the way, this was talk radio, so it was interactive. People will get on talk radio and say the most personal, intimate, private things about their lives. And for some reason, their brain goes into suspended animation and they forget. They would never say this to their friends, their best friends. They they wouldn't say it in their church, but they'd call up the radio station and they would share the most intimate details of their lives um, on the radio. And people, people liked the reality of that, because Jesus Christ is real. You know what I'm saying? Jesus Christ is not some religious gig. Um, as I often said on the program, and I say it on this program, the Paul McGuire Report, Jesus Christ is not about playing church. That, that makes Jesus Christ want to barf. And if you want a translation of that, that makes Jesus want to barf, puke, or vomit. If you're offended with that language, then you need to take it up with Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, because he chose, when he was addressing the church, the Laodicean church, he warned them. He said, you're neither hot spiritually or cold spiritually. You're, you're stuck in the middle, Jesus said to the Laodicean church. And he said, because you're stuck in the middle, you're lukewarm. And then Jesus said, and because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, those are strong words. But you see, Jesus does not like people who play church at all. Because what it is, it's, it's the ultimate mockery of the truth. You know, Jesus Christ died on a cross for crying out loud. He died an agonizing death on the cross so that he could take upon himself personally all of your sins, all of my sins, and the sins of every man and woman ever born. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all of our sins on a cross so that if we put our faith or belief in what Jesus Christ did, He will cleanse us of all sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then if we put our faith in the Word of God and invite Jesus Christ into our lives and ask him to make us born again, then we can be born again. That means we're guaranteed entrance into heaven and we're guaranteed eternal life. Now, that's not religion, man. That's the ultimate trip. The ultimate trip. And I'm not talking about an acid trip. I'm talking about the ultimate trip is receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and becoming, having the core of your identity radically change from the inside out. You become a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. That means when you die, you're going to instantly go into heaven and appear before Jesus in a brand new glorified body. Now, that's intense, right? That's intense. So I forgot the exact population of 
just the state of California. But the state of California is like a nation in and of itself. And so for over 10 years, we were able to influence countless millions of people. And at the very beginning, the hours of the program, we happened to be broadcasting, and our signal would go into every car, every SUV, every van, that every soccer mom in California and states all across the United States, the soccer moms would play the program full volume so they could get the word of God into the hearts and minds of, of uh, their children. And so we reach millions of people by the grace of God. And truth has power. Truth has a specific frequency. Just like you and I have a particular frequency, truth has a frequency. You've heard the expression, that rings true or that doesn't sound true to me. Well, that means a lot of things. Psychologically, it doesn't sound true. Intellectually, it doesn't sound true. But in your gut, and by the way, we have, according to scientists, you have and I have, essentially three, we have one brain, three major compartments to our brain. We have the brain between our ears, the head brain. We have the, the brain in our heart area called the heart brain. <clears throat> and then we have the brain <clears throat> in our stomach area uh, called the, uh, the, the, the stomach brain or whatever. Why? Because in the head brain, in the heart brain, and the stomach brain, there are billions and trillions of neurological pathways that contain brain circuit, circuits such as memory storage units, processing of perception, regulating a heartbeat, and, and stuff like that. So we have three brains. And when something rings true, it rings true on an electromagnetic frequency vibrational level. You can, you can feel it. It's not about emotion. It's about the fact that if you trained your perception to pay attention, in other words, you turn your brain switch on, and that means you activate the God-given ability to have heightened perception. You can sense, and it's more than intuition, you can sense the electromagnetic frequency of something that is true versus if somebody's lying to you. And it's amazing how many people uh, can't operate in that basic realm. I mean, for crying out loud, my mother, who's not a Christian, raised me to look at people's eyes. She wasn't into the occult. She wasn't into mysticism. She was a hardcore secular humanist. But she told me how to read people. She told me how to look in people's eyes and use my perception. And uh, she taught me how to turn up my awareness and my perception to such a point that if somebody was lying to me, you can, you can actually feel it on a vibrational level. And that's not mysticism. That's the way God created all of us to operate. The problem is that uh, people have forgotten and people have been dumbed down. Uh, so they, 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 they can't access that, those perception modalities. This is what I was looking for. In the state of California currently, there are 39.56 million people. That means in the state of California, there are 40 million people. So the Paul McGuire show at that time was broadcasting because it broadcasted everywhere in California to a potential audience of 40 million people. That's just California alone. And why that is a God thing is because a huge percentage of those 40 million people that live in California are stuck in traffic. And they had nowhere to go but to tune into the AM740 frequency. And people got saved. Uh, I was talking to a woman one time uh, who called me live. And she was driving from California. And she was driving to St. Louis. And she called me live. And, I, and somehow we got to the bottom of her problem. She was on her way to St. Louis to divorce her husband who lived in California. 
And we talked, and I asked her, what, what, what did the Lord want you to do? And, and, and she got conv- I didn't beat her over the head and say, thou shall not divorce. I just ministered to her in the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit convicted her, and she uh, uh, got convicted. I didn't have to say much more. She got convicted by the Holy Spirit, began to sob and weep in the car, and then turned around and drove all the way back from St. Louis to California uh, to join her husband and, and give it a second chance. I had one guy calling me. And we weren't talking about pornography on the show. I don't know what we were talking about. But he called up. He was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I wasn't preaching fire and brimstone sermons. I was just talking about Jesus, and he got convicted by the Holy Spirit. And he just decided to say live over the air that he had a massive collection of porno DVDs and other porn, and he felt convicted by God to to get rid of his huge porn stash. So I asked, what does God want you to do? And he, and he tell, told me, he says, God wants me to get rid of it. And I said to him, well, how does God want you to get rid of it? And he says, I don't know, I'll throw it in the dumpster or something. And I said, well, what if somebody else gets it, like a, like a teenage boy? So he decided, while talking to me live on the air, that um, he was going to uh, go home. And what he did, literally, live on the air, was he took all his porno collection he took it out to the barbecue in his backyard. He poured lighter fluid on it, and he burned up live on the air all, I don't know, you know, uh, hundreds of uh, whatever, DVDs or whatever, uh, pornos that he had. He just burned it up live on the air. And we have miracles like that happen all the time. Um, we had soldiers getting saved. We had people on the way to commit suicide getting saved. What caused them to get saved? It wasn't my brilliant uh, uh, ability to talk. That's, that's not what it did. It It was on, on a deep inner level. Jesus said, out of your inmost being will flow rivers of living water. So if you're walking in a relationship with Jesus, a supernatural relationship with Jesus, okay, when you're walking in a supernatural relationship with Jesus and you're born again, and the Spirit of God lives inside you, that Spirit transmits. And in this case, the specific electromagnetic frequency of the Holy Spirit, and I have no idea what the numerical number is in the EMF field. I have no idea what it is. But out of my inmost being, the rivers of living water were flowing, which bathes and anoints the words that I was saying. So it wasn't the, the brilliance of my argument. It was the fact that the words that I was speaking over the air were literally charged with a resonant frequency uh, of the Holy Spirit. Out of your inmost being will flow rivers of, uh, rivers of living water. And so then there's the frequency of the AM station, in this case, AM 740. And there's the frequency of the Holy Spirit coupled with the, with the frequency of the AM and FM stations, and people, they're drawn to it like a magnet. They're starving. Why are they starving for it? Because political conservative talk can be very useful and informative. Uh, in some cases, if it has integrity, li- liberal uh, uh, talk can be informative, so, so at least you know what's going on. But that's not why people were listening. People were magnetically attracted to the station, again, not because of my charismatic personality, despite my personality, okay? They were, they felt the conviction, not the condemnation. They felt the pull, the pull of of something deeper and more powerful. They felt the pull of eternal life coming down from heaven bathing an AM station, and then hitting the nation and other nations and all of California. So why did, why, why did I do this long preamble? Because as Albert Einstein said, the great physicist, everything we see in this physical realm is a projection created by 
a specific electromagnetic frequency. So depending upon what emotions I'm harboring in my heart and mind, and remember we have three brains, because memory, emotions, heart, mind, anger, hatred, racism, prejudice, love, lust, whatever, whatever we, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we open a door in our lives, intentionally or unintentionally, we begin to transmit on a particular electromagnetic frequency what we're receiving into our hearts. That's why Jesus said, guard your heart, because out of it come the issues of life or the, or the particular EMF frequency or life force of life. See, I'll say it again. Jesus Christ said, guard your heart. That's, that's your brain here. Because out of it flow the issues or the forces of life, the energy force of life, good or bad. So if you're filled with racism and you hate and despise somebody of another race or ethnic group, you store it in your heart, <clears throat> your mind, your stomach or whatever. You become you're the God-given electromagnetic frequency that you're supposed to be generating becomes static instead of it, instead of it becoming a life force because Jesus said out of our inmost being flows the rivers of living water where's our inmost being it's somewhere in the heart area or the stomach area there are you know trillions of neurological pathways memory storage units a, a whole spectrum of biochemicals each one emitting a different frequency. So whatever we're meditating on, whatever we're thinking on, whatever we're, we're feeding ourselves with, okay, uh, that's, well, that's what we become. And so what happens is we automatically generate as if, just pretend for a moment, you are an AM or FM broadcasting station and that your life functions just like an AM broadcasting radio tower or an FM broadcasting radio tower. And the frequency that you're broadcasting on is determined by what you're programming yourself with. Are you feeding on the Word of God? Are you walking with Jesus? Are you filling yourself with hate? And so that, that becomes a force, an energy field, electromagnetic frequency. You know, that's not a New Age term. I'm not preaching a New Age gospel. That's not the point. If we were, this really troubles me because I've written 34 books and I've done tremendous amount of research, not only in Bible prophecy and the Bible and uh, looking through the lens of the Bible and Bible prophecy and examining, for example, DNA, genetics, creation, uh, history, uh, uh, the multi-dimensional nature of our reality, and on and on and on, studying all these things. And I'm perpetually frustrated because in my studies, as well as my past life history, I was raised an atheist. I was programmed not to believe in God. Uh, I, I began to be deeply involved in the New Age movement, the occult, meditation, Eastern mysticism, psychedelic drugs, gurus, all that stuff. And what happened was that um, I, I began, I didn't realize that by doing those things, I was opening, my, opening myself to external influence and spiritual deception by demonic forces. Now, these forces are not the Holy Spirit, because they don't come from God. They come from Lucifer or Satan. Why? Because Satan is a liar, and he's the father of lies. And so what he says compositionally, if you were to break down the verbiage, the vocabulary of Lucifer, Satan, and his followers, their music, their literature, what they produce and create, it's all charged with a Luciferian death frequency, or a Luciferian deception frequency that is an active militant rebellion from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And sometimes an individual without 
realizing it because he or she, you know, I'm talking to people right now who in your life's journey, you've never, maybe you've never tuned in and, and watched me, Paul McGuire, on the Paul McGuire report. Maybe you never saw this before. But I'm talking to you, and I have a deep knowing, okay? You can call it intuition. I would call it a gift of the Holy Spirit. But I have a deep knowing, for example, as I'm communicating to you, that there are many of you in your life's pilgrimage, in your life's choices, you opened yourself up. You opened up a portal. You opened up doors in the invisible realm. And you allowed for the entrance, either internally or externally, of satanic spiritual deception, deceiving spirits. The Bible says, for the God of this age, that's Lucifer or Satan, has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving that they might not see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Lucifer and his demonic forces can so blind a person from the truth that they are no longer, or at least in a temporal sense, they can't see who Jesus is. And you know what happens when you can't see who Jesus is? It's like you fall under a hypnotic spell. And when you're walking in spiritual deception, you are deceived into believing that Jesus Christ is not the God of love. And you project out of your own inner darkness or you project out of the darkness that has been seeded into you a a mythological or false impression about who Jesus is. You misperceive Jesus as this legalistic, vindictive, Old Old Testament angry God who's just itching to hurl a lightning bolt down upon your life and blow you to smithereens. Or because you did whatever is a sin. Maybe it's just a sin in your head, or maybe it really is a sin. You think God is just up there drooling and waiting to torture you. Those are all lies. You're believing lies about God. And so that's what that verse means. For for the God of this world, Lucifer, has blinded your eyes, the eyes of the unbelieving, So they might not see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because if you see see the truth of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, it's like the heavens crack open and bam, you're set free. You're set free on every level and you're granted eternal life. And you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven. And you have this inner knowing. The words of Jesus Christ become true when Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That emanates a, that emanates the mother load of all electromagnetic frequencies. And that's the mother load of God is love and Jesus is the truth that will set you free. When you are functioning or being, like B-E-I-N-G, when you're in a state of being or a state of consciousness, or you're in a place in life, or you're in a, uh, a altered state of consciousness, that, that may be, let me give you an example of an altered state of consciousness. Yeah, taking LSD and listening to the Beatles song, you know, Uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, that's an example of an altered state of consciousness. The psychedelic drug LSD produces the altered state of consciousness. But when you are out of frequency with God, you see, God created you and I to be in a synchronized, that means we're hooked up on a pure power level. When, When you and God are walking in a synchronized relationship. That means you're hooked up and and you are communing with God on on a common electromagnetic electromagnetic frequency. Now, a lot of Christians get hung up by words like that because it's their problem they get hung up. Because you see, unless, unless you 
dumb down Jesus. A lot of Christians see they're worshiping. They're, you know, God says we're not supposed to worship idols, right? God says we're not supposed to worship idols or false gods. It says it, in, it says it in the Ten Commandments, and it says it in Deuteronomy 28. We're not supposed to be worshiping an idol. What is an idol? An idol is something that's like symbolic. It could be a statue of a cow. It could be sex. An idol is anything that you are worshiping or looking to, to be God, but really isn't God. It's a false God. That's what an idol is. And whenever a nation or an individual is worshiping a false God, okay, like the children of Israel, when when Moses went in and delivered the children of Israel from what I call the Pharaoh God King system, and you need to understand that, that's a power slave control system that's still in operation today. You need to understand it. You should get my book, The Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Here's Volume 2. And Volume 1 is, is, is Volume 1 and Volume 2. And I talk about what happens when any nation, in this particular case, it was the nation of Israel, who were called by God to walk as the people of God before a pagan world. But when any people, the Jews or self-professed Christians or atheists or whatever, whenever an individual, a, a culture, a group, an ethnic group or whatever, chooses collectively or individually to be out of sync or synchronization with the true God, and Christians get hung up on this, and they say, oh, you're talking New Age, you're talking mysticism. No. I hate to break it to you. Christianity is is like, has become an aberration of what it is. There was an old, weird movie. What was it called? The, the theme, theme song of this movie was, Let's do the time warp again. I'm a terrible singer. You shake it to the left, you shake it to the right. Somebody help me. You know what that song It was the, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Didn't see the whole movie. Didn't have to, because at the time, the Rocky Horror Picture Show was opening as a Broadway play on Broadway and 44th Street. God had saved me from being in altered states of consciousness, being a radical in the counterculture. I was made, even though I was white, I was made officially, officially an honorary member of the original Black Panther Party, hanging out with Timothy Leary, the LSD prophet, and Harvard professor, et cetera, et cetera. So while I, God had me uh, uh, pr- producing and promoting contemporary music concerts with, with the biggest artists of, of, of that time period, which was the 70s, right? And I, I would fly them in from all over the country to perform at the Lambs Club, a famous theater, uh, dining room, uh, living complex. It was a combination of a Broadway theater and everything else. It was phenomenal. And we would minister to people, and thousands of people would come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I was only saved for two years. Um, people like Noel Paul Stuckey performed there, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Keith Green was there the night of the great New York City blackout. And um, simultaneously, while the, the Lord uh, was saving thousands of people, and influencing tens of thousands of people from the Lambs Club on 44th Street and Broadway. Just, you know, a couple of hundred feet from the front door of the Lambs Club, a famous Broadway theater was there. I forgot its name. But they were debuting the, 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 the Broadway musical, the, Rock, uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. You know, you know, the transvestites and the whole thing. Some of you may know it. Some of you don't know. So here's the thing. When people are presented with truth, they sense it vibrationally, and they're drawn to it. That's why people became born again. So when, when you're preaching truth, not hate, when you're preaching what the Word of God really says, not, not cultural, playing church stuff, people flock to it, and people flock to it. And they accepted Jesus Christ as their... Lord and Savior. So, 
The point is, the way I was saved out of the New Age and the occult and all that stuff. You can go to paulmcguire.us. I have my testimony. It's going to be up there soon. And it's going to, it's going to be in a whole series of videos. It's a very powerful testimony. It's literally, and I'm not exaggerating, my testimony by the grace of God <coughs> has been heard or seen by, I would say, approximately 334 million people worldwide. You say, how could that be? Because by the grace of God, the Lord continually has opened doors for the last 40 years for me to share my entire testimony on countless Christian television networks, crusades, conferences, radio programs, books, front cover magazine articles, and just an endless uh, exposure of my testimony through mass media over 40 years. Okay? And this was, this was in the time period when, you know, uh, a show like The 700 Club this is before cable and all that. The 700 Club, which featured my testimony, you know, their, their audience would be back then 25 million people. All right. Those numbers or higher. Uh, those numbers are very difficult to achieve now. But what what brings people is it resonates as true. People know it's true. So where, where am I going with all this? Where I'm going with all this is that. It's not new age to discuss the gospel of Jesus Christ, Genesis to Revelation. It's not new age to analyze. God, the Bible is so advanced. It's so scientific. It's all historically true. So God created us. He created DNA. He created us genetically. There are the laws of physics, the laws of uh, biological creation and DNA and genetics and so many multidimensional reality. God was talking about all of these things before so-called modern science and modern man even knew. Now, let me give you an example. In the book of Leviticus, there appears to be a lot of these like archaic laws that God commanded the ancient Jews to abide by. And if you were to read those a hundred years ago, people would mock and say, what is this Christian Jewish nonsense? Okay? Because God had laws for the ancient Jews, like you had to make sure your your the 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 the, the, the linen or whatever that they used, material that they slept on was washed and sanitized. The the, the, the Jewish religion washing of the hands. There was like a hyper-focus in the Jewish religion on hygienics, cleanliness. If a woman was having her period, uh, there were certain things that could be done and could not be done. Uh, Nutrition, foods. God uh, forbid the ancient Jews to eat shellfish. And and so many other uh, laws, which a hundred years ago uh, appeared to be old-fashioned, archaic, uh, uh, you know, like like a bunch of hillbillies believed in it. But see, as time went by, God was light years ahead of mankind. What God was trying to do was stop the transmission of disease, viruses, bacteria, and all the other stuff. So, Thousands and thousands of years before modern science even knew what bacteria was, even knew what a virus was, even knew what was happening in the molecular world of germs and infections and transmission and hygiene and and cleansing of the body, etc., etc., before modern man even had a clue as to these regimens and protocols that are necessary to stop the transmission of disease, God spelled it all out in in the book of Leviticus, the Levitical laws given to the Levitical priests. Why did he do that? Because he was hung up? No, because he knew that certain activities, certain practices, so for example, the eating of shellfish, why did God uh, forbid that to, to the ancient Jews? He forbid it because 
uh, shellfish, uh, lobsters, shrimp, blah, 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 are known as bottom feeders. They stay on the bottom of the ocean floor, etc., and they can, they're the garbage trucks. The shellfish are God's garbage, garbage trucks, and the shellfish consume the unhealthy uh, food type products, the disease, the, the stuff. The shellfish eat all the garbage that human beings, if human beings uh, disobey God's word, like when the Jews would disobey God's word and eat all the garbage that the shellfish ate, including the shellfish, they would get all these diseases. Their immune system would crash. They would die early. Why was that? Because God understood thousands of years before science understood that when you're going to eat shellfish, shellfish are packed with diseases, uh, uh, chemicals, and, and uh, other things that destroy the immune system and increase your vulnerability to dying early, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. See how smart God is? God's not a fool. And then we talk about the multidimensional nature of the universe. I mean, for crying out loud, atheists, blah, 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 mock God, mock the Bible. But they're the bozos on the bus. I used to have, the first year I went to the University of Missouri, um, I lived in the dormitory, the male dormitory. Back then it was male, female dormitories. And God forbid if you broke the rules. Believe me, I, I broke the rule and I paid the price. They let me back in. Okay, so here's the deal. The guy whose who's door to his room, which was literally across the small hallway from my room, there was always literal. it was like the entire building was on fire. There was all this smoke pouring out from under the crack of his doorway and this hysterical laughter as this guy and his five buddies, they were like Cheech and Chong, you know, the dope smoking comedians from like the 70s or whatever. They were, my roommate and his friends were like Cheech and Chong on steroids. They smoke, smoke, smoke more dope marijuana per hour than any human being could possibly consume. And it would come pouring out of the crack under his door. And so one time I knocked the door and I said, can you turn, turn it down? Because he would play, it was, it, was, it was called the Something Theater. It was a comedy album. And one of the lines was, we're all bozos on this bus. Bozo was a clown when I was a kid. And so he would, him and his buddies were so stoned on premium grade marijuana that they would play with the record player this one line over and over again. We're all bozos on this bus. And then I'd see the, the funneling of pot smoke coming up from the door. And then every time they played the line, we're all bozos on this bus. It was a something theater comedy group. It would be, we're all bozos on this bus. And it would be followed by, literally, psychotic, hysterical laughter over that one line for like 10 minutes straight. I mean, they would go into a psychotic, hysterical laughing fit. And then when they finally calm, calm down and lip the bong pipe and then pass the reefer around they'd hear they'd play that line again we're all bozos on the spot and laugh hysterically now remember i'm a hippie that came from new york city so like it's i'm not adverse to, to pot smoking but this is like this is like ken Kesey's ken Kesey, ken Kesey's novel one flew over the cuckoo's nest these people are like so stone he graduated and by the way with high grades so i don't know what that tells you anyway the point is that all these laws, so for example, science dogmatically, uh, modern science for thousands of years, militantly taught the scientific method. And science, along with communism and Marxism and humanism, dogmatically and rigidly indoctrinated all would be scientists and the scientific method. And one of the things in, in that encompassed the scientific method was that the only thing that is real is those things which you can perceive with your physical senses. 
So only that which you perceive with your physical senses, such as visual, eyesight, hearing, sound, ears, taste buds, touch, tactile senses, smell, and I probably forgot one. Okay, so according to science, for at least 100 years, and it's still lingering, nothing is real, nothing can be true, unless it is part of your sensory perception. If you can't see it, taste it, smell it, it doesn't exist. Okay? So, and then the scientific method was, you can't have an idea, you can't have a belief system, you can't have a theory. You can have a theory, but you, you never uh, teach a theory as if it's a scientific truth or a fact. In order for something to be true and a scientific fact, you must have what scientists called empirical evidence. So the scientific method was a method of exploration and discovery where you'd have an hypothesis, like the Earth is, is relatively a sphere or whatever, or the law of gravity. Let's take the law of gravity. That's e easier. So the hypothesis is, is that there's a law of gravity. And it's easy to test the law of gravity. If you take a weight or something and drop it off the Empire State Building, it's going to go down. Objects from a high place will always go down. Law of gravity. You can prove it pretty simply. The theory of evolution, on the other hand, is a theory that man evolved over 400 million years. Man evolved from uh, an inanimate, lifeless object like a rock. And then through random chance evolution, complete random chance over hundreds of millions of years, uh, a protoplasm, a molecule, eventually, after hundreds of millions of years, would evolve into uh, a dinosaur, a dog, an ape, a chimpanzee, uh, and finally a homo sapien or homo sapien or man. The only problem with Darwin's theory of evolution is that, according to the scientific method, they have no empirical scientific evidence to prove the theory of evolution. In other words, they have collected approximately, I think the current number, I'm probably understating it, scientists have collected at least 80 million fossil records in an attempt to find a fossil that shows scientific evidence of what they call the missing link, where there's some kind of evidence of a primitive creature, and then you take it to the next step up, and instead of there being a gap, there's other creatures, and then eventually you have man. The problem is, after collecting 80 million fossil records, they have never acquired or accumulated scientific proof that the theory of evolution is true, because they have no empirical scientific evidence. It's not enough just to have a theory or a belief. Right now, Evolution is a religion. Secular humanism is a religion. The Supreme Court defined secular humanism as a religion. It is the it, secular humanism is takes more faith to be a secular humanist than it does to be a Christian because you have to reject reason, you have to reject the lack of scientific evidence, and say that man exists and God does not exist because man just evolved out of nothing over hundreds of millions of years. It's not true. So it's disproven. Now, God in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, first of all, you read Genesis. Genesis, here's a Bible right here. Okay? I know somebody's going to take a picture of me holding up a Bible on social media, and they will attempt to distort it and try to uh, uh, characterize me as a non thinking Bible thumper. No, I'm not thumping the Bible. I'm holding the Bible up with respect. Because there are, for example, there are thousands of prophecies in the Bible about future events that are predicted in, in precise detail. Most of those prophecies have already been fulfilled in the, pri in the precise detail predicted in the Bible. There are still other prophecies in the Bible that are yet to come to pass. Perhaps the greatest, well, two of the greatest prophetic super signs in the Bible 
would be the, the numerous predictions of the first coming of Jesus Christ, that he would be born of a virgin, that he would die and resurrect from the dead. The resurrection of Christ in front of uh, uh, an impeccable audience of legally qualified witnesses will testify that Christ resurrected from the dead. Okay, so you, you have Christ, the second coming of Christ, Christ being born of a virgin. You have so many precise little details about Christ's life that were predicted in the Old Testament supernaturally. And then you have um, like the prophecies regarding Israel. So the Bible predicts in numerous places in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that in the last days that the Jews, after they were dispersed, the Bible predicts the dispersion of the Jews from the land of Israel, which happened uh, shortly after Christ ascended into heaven, which was also predicted in the Old Testament. Christ ascends into heaven. And there's a prophecy uh, that talks about the, the invasion of Jerusalem, destruction of King Herod's temple or the Jewish temple, <clears throat> um, and how the Jewish temple would be totally destroyed, torn apart brick by brick. And it's in precise detail that the, they would, the enemies of Israel, which were the Roman armies, under uh, the Roman general Titus, dismantled the Jewish temple, tore it down brick by brick, set it on fire, so that there was literally molten liquid rivers of gold from the gold ornaments inside the temple being so hot because it was set on fire. This was all predicted in great detail by Jesus. So what happened? Um, Shortly after Jesus Christ died, ascended into heaven, and he made that prophecy to his disciples in in exquisite precision and detail. The Roman general Titus invades Israel, destroys the temple, burns it down, just like the Bible predicts. And then if you reach back into the Old Testament, there are numerous Old Testament prophets which predict in mathematical precision and detail that after the uh, temple is destroyed in Jerusalem, that the Jews will be scattered into the four corners of the earth, that the Jews would be sold into slavery and sold as slaves and shipped off to be slaves all over planet earth. This was prophesied in precise detail uh, by Jesus Christ and Old Testament prophets, and it happened. So when the Jews were sold off into slavery and shipped to all the four corners of the earth, that was called the the dispersion. And uh, they were separated from the land of Israel and Jerusalem for over 2,000 years. Then approximately 2,000 years after the Jewish dispersion and after Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust, between the years 1947 and 1948, specifically 1948, the Jews supernaturally come back to the land of Israel and resettle Jerusalem and Israel, which was part of numerous prophecies in the Old Testament. And it took 2,000 years to fulfill. But the reason modern Israel exists in the land of Israel and Jerusalem today. It's a fulfillment of, among many prophecies, such as the prophetic prediction birthed out of the covenant that God made with um, um, Israel, that they would be scattered into all the nations, and in the last days they would be returned to the land of Israel, because God made a land Covenant. God made a supernatural covenant or contract with the Jews to give them the physical land of Israel. And in 1948, that was fulfilled. After 2,000 years of separation or exile from Israel, supernaturally, the Jews are 
brought back into uh, ancient Israel. And, and you see uh, this written about in Deuteronomy and, and, and so many other passages of the Bible. In addition to that, Bible prophecy also speaks of the last days, the counterfeit Christ, the false Christ, and the Bible talks about um, the Jews being deceived by the false prophet and the Antichrist, um, and they sign a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel, which the Antichrist violates after three and a half years. That's halfway into the seven-year tribulation period, and the abomination of desolation, or the Antichrist, is, sets himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem, and he, he betrays the Jews. It's all in Bible prophecy, so we know what's happening in the future. Now, here's the critical thing. The multidimensional nature of the universe. Long before Albert Einstein and physics and quantum physics and string theory, we know that God lives in a different dimension. That is, the, word, the precise word dimension isn't used, but there are numerous references to the fact that God, the, the personal living God of the universe, the infinite personal living God of the universe, the biblical God, lives in a dimension beyond space and time. You and I live in a space and time dimension. But God, because he's eternal, lives outside of space and time. And that's why there exists a spiritual world or an invisible realm, or a parallel universe. So whether we're talking about Elisha, the prophet, uh, and his servant, Elijah, uh, Elisha prays to God that his servant, Elijah, he says something to the effect, Lord, open the eyes of my servant. And God, because, because uh, uh, Elijah's servant is terrified because the king of Syria is invading the armies of Israel with a massive army, and the king of Syria and all these other armies are going to slaughter, blood slaughter, the armies of Israel. And Elijah's servant is in total despair. He's suicidal. He's freaked out. So God, in answer to the prayer from Elijah, supernaturally opens the eyes of Elijah so he can see. And what does Elijah, the servant of Elijah, say? He sees into the invisible realm, another dimension. And he says, he shouts out these words, Behold, the hills are filled with chariots of fire. And those that be with us are more than those that be with them. God gave the servant of Elijah the supernatural ability to see into another dimension. This dimension is called the invisible realm, the spiritual world or the parallel universe. And what does he see? He sees beings who inhabit the spiritual realm that are on God's side. So he sees the armies of heaven, which are coming in from another dimension. And the armies of heaven first reveal themselves with the technology of God, known as the chariots of fire. These are not just mere chariots. These are chariots that, that are ignited as if they're burning. But it's more than that. These chariots of fire, along with the angelic armies that are riding them, along with the angelic armies that are accompanying them, are coming out of a portal in, from another dimension, the invisible world, the spiritual world. And all of a sudden, it is Elijah's ability to see into the spiritual world, the invisible realm, opens his eyes to true truth, final reality. And he's able to see into another dimension, and that's why he says, Behold, the hills are filled with chariots of fire, and those that be with us are more than those that be with them. That means all the armies of the king of Syria are minuscule compared to the majesty and the numerical superiority and the supernatural element of the armies of God and the technology of God embodied in chariots of fire and, and the armies that are anointed with the same fire. What, what was he looking at? 
He was looking into another dimension beyond space and time. And there are constant references to the multidimensional nature of reality revealed in the Bible thousands of years before quantum physics finally got a clue and decided that, gee, there are more dimensions than just what our physical senses can perceive. In fact, quantum uh, physics said there has to be at least 12 or 13 dimensions. So quantum physics rejects the old physics, which says it's just the only thing there is is what we can see with our senses. And then string theory takes it further. And string theory not only uh, says that science now understands that there are at least 12 or 13 dimensions, most of them unseen by our physical senses, but the very nature and composition of what is in these other dimensions comes under the umbrella of string theory, which means that the alternative reality that exists beyond our physical dimension is composed of what can be described as vibrating strings. Now, why would quantum physics and the proponents of string theory describe this other dimensional world as not only having 12 to 13 dimensions, but being composed of what is described as vibrating strings. What, 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 what comes to your mind when I say vibrating strings? Music, a guitar, a, a piano, a violin. Um, there are so many instruments that use strings. Let's just take a guitar, okay? Whether it's classical, whether it's rock and roll, whether it's jazz, there's numerous stringed instruments, violin, cello, guitar, electrical guitar. And the sounds that you and I hear, whether it's classical music, hip-hop, rap, uh, rock and roll, whatever, is produced by yeah, piano, drums, but vibrating strings. And so every one of these vibrating strings Every unique vibrating strings produces a specific note of musical frequency. And that specific note of vibrating mu a musical frequency, also known as EMF, electromagnetic frequency. So stringed instruments like the stringed, the lyre that King David played. Okay, the lyre that King David played. When Joshua what took his armies, and he had the worship leaders march before them before they invaded Jericho and other places. They were using instruments, horns, blah, 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 but also vibrating strings. Every musical sound operates on a distinct, unique EMF electromagnetic frequency. That has the ability to change emotion, to change cognition, to change reality. The Bible understood this thousands of years ago. So think of King David. He was a poet. He was a lyricist. He played a musical instrument. He was a singer. Um, and the different frequencies that King David played had the power under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to alter or reframe reality. That is not only that has a, a, multitude, a multitude of purposes, and God wants his people to rediscover the multiplicity of purposes based on the electromagnetic frequencies that are distinct and different, produced by both music and other things. Now, let's, let's take it to where we are. We see riots in the streets. We see protests in the streets. We see uh, burning buildings, looting. We see uh, uh, police. Uh, killing and shooting and beating up uh, protesters and whatever. We see protesters and demonstrators, some of them like Antifa, mainly white guys, uh, who are operating according to the Marxist 
communist playbook, uh, attempting to ignite a communist Marxist revolution in our cities. And it's very disturbing. What's happening? What is the relationship of the supernatural body of Christ to what we're seeing on television in America? What is the relationship between uh, frequency, electromagnetic frequencies, specific frequencies, and the chaos and the violence and the hatred and the fires and the killings and the shootings? What is the relationship to that and EMF? And then we have the coronavirus, which I believe escaped out of a biological warfare laboratory in Wuhan, China. In fact, I research all the background for that in my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. I deal extensively with the secret of 5G technology, which produces a specific electromagnetic frequency. The coronavirus, every disease, every virus, every bacteria, every healthy cell, in fact, the strength of your immune system are all products of a specific electromagnetic frequency. Therefore, the coronavirus is not only uh, uh, a microbiological uh, infection or whatever you want to call it, the coronavirus is emanating and spreading based on a specific, measurable electromagnetic frequency. The violence and the chaos and the riots and the hatred, etc., etc., the lying, the deception, is emanating from a specific EMF electromagnetic frequency. I talk about all of this in detail. You need to get educated. My book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, is a power-packed ride that will download into your heart and mind. It will fill you with love, but it will also, it's also weaponized to destroy disease, hatred, Luciferian forces. So this book is about, I don't know, um, 380 pages, 383 pages, The Greatest Battle. You need to read it. Why? Because it is not weaponized to kill, hurt, and maim, but words, uh, and the way words are put together, constitute a specific electromagnetic frequency. This book is on an electromagnetic frequency level. This book, if you were able to look at it through a a subatomic microscope, this book and the words in it is vibrating, literally. The thoughts and ideas and projections and beliefs and Biblical truth that is contained in this book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, came out two months before the coronavirus. This book is words, ideas, beliefs, and truth that has been specifically synchronized by me, the author, to target. Death, disease, destruction, demonic forces, the spirit of Antichrist, this book is weaponized to take down the spirit of Antichrist, or let me just say it metaphorically, however, uh, uh, however Goliath manifests himself in our contemporary culture. Those of you that are up to speed know what I'm talking about. The companion book, we have four book bundles. You need to get it. Conquering the Matrix. Conquering the Matrix also talks about EMF frequencies and the mind 
and how hypnotic programming can occur. The, the game, it's not really a game, it's life and death, but the game, what God wants us to learn, what did David learn? David was a poet. Those are words. The poetry of David vibrates at a specific electromagnetic frequency that brings the reader closer to God. David's the only man in the Bible that God calls a man after his own heart. So the Psalms of David and his, and, and his lyrical music and his poetry have an electromagnetic frequency that brings you into a close relationship with God even if you may have sinned in your past. David was the only man in the Bible that God ever called a man after his own heart. Why? David committed adultery. David lied. David murdered. Those are pretty heavy-duty sins. And yet, when the day was done, God called David a man after my own heart. He's the only person in the Bible that, that, that God gives that title to. And then you look at, and you need to get the book bundle, the two volumes of A Prophecy of the Future of America. His son Solomon was operating on the frequency of God, okay, because his prayers were true. And truth emanates a vibrational frequency that sets people free. So Solomon asked God in prayer for only one thing, Lord, give me wisdom that I might lead thy people rightly or in the right way. And God responds to Solomon and says to him these words. He said, Solomon, because you asked me for only one thing in prayer, you asked me for the wisdom to lead my people rightly. He said, because you asked for that, the Lord said to Solomon, and you didn't ask for wisdom or riches or wealth or for selfish things, but because you humbly asked me for wisdom so you could lead my people rightly. See, that calibrated the prayer of Solomon to resonate with the frequency of God. You ask, well, how, how come my prayers aren't answered? If your prayers are not uh, going into the throne room of God, resonating the frequency of God, Okay. In other words, if you're not praying from the same heart that Jesus Christ is praying from, the heart, you're not going to see the miracles that you want, the provision that you want, because you're out of sync. Your vibration is off. It's like you're a musician and you're off note. So God said to him, because you didn't ask me for selfish things like wealth and power and fame, but you only asked me for wisdom to lead my people rightly. The Lord said, because, because of the purity of your prayer, I am going to give you what you did not ask for. And so the Lord said, Solomon, I am going to make you the wisest man who ever lived. And I am going to make you the wealthiest man who ever lived. So because Solomon's prayer resonated with the throne room of God, God gave to Solomon not only what he asked for, which was wisdom to lead God's people, but God gave him over and above because he was praying with the right motive, and he literally made Solomon the wealthiest man that ever lived and the wisest man that ever lived. You look at history. You read the book I wrote, Volume 2 of A Prophecy of the Future of America. Solomon was worth quadrillions of dollars. Okay, and you, you're worried about your job. You're worried about your paycheck. You're worried about this monetary need and that monetary need. Let me ask you a question: Are the prayers that you you are praying are they in sync with God? Because that's the that's how it works. If your prayers are out of sync with God, your prayers will be discordant. When a person prays discordant pra prayers, that's, that's that can be a musical term. It's like playing an instrument instrument off key. It's a sour note. Okay? You've all heard a musician when, when a piano is in tuned or somebody's playing a trumpet and they go off note. I'm not a musician, you can tell. So, but it sounds it's grating. Well, your prayers can either go right into the throne room of God and you can see 
the supernatural, miraculous answers to prayer on a level you've never seen before. But the key, according to the law of God, is, is that you must, in your inner man or woman, resonate the frequency with God. This is not New Age. What it simply means is that the purity of your heart, the intent of your heart, must match up and sync up with the purity of God's heart. If it does, God will move heaven and earth in your behalf. Now, let me read you this, because all hell is breaking loose in America and around the world. Violence, political fighting like we've never seen. And every, every person who, who loves God um, is required to pray for our nation. You are required to pray for our nation, and you are required by God to pray for those leaders, those candidates, and those political parties that you may be in disagreement with. That's fine. You, you're entitled to be in disagreement with them. But God commands you to pray for those politicians and political parties that you agree with, but he also commands you to pray for those that you don't agree with. If you're, if you're not doing that, you're not in synchronization with God, and you're going to see a power shortage in your life. You're not going to see the ignition of the biblical revival that God is ready to unleash on this nation. But you see, the laws of the kingdom of God require that you and I pray in synchronization. We must resonate at the same frequency of God, which is the word of God and the love of God. Okay. I want to read you something the Apostle Paul said. This is so powerful, man. This is like this is more powerful than nuclear energy. It's more powerful than anything discovered by Nikola Tesla, although Nikola Tesla, um, certainly not a Christian, he was deep into discovering, deep into harnessing, deep into accessing unlimited power from another dimension and drawing it down into this physical dimension. All the, the, this nonsense about that the dollar has to be backed up by oil, the, the petrodollar, they call it. All this nonsense about sustainable development. All this nonsense about climate change. Why am I saying all this nonsense? I'm not attacking the concern over climate change. I'm not attacking the concern over the, the, the petrodollar. I'm not attacking the legitimate concern over sustainability. I'm not attacking that. When I'm attacking it, that, what I'm attacking is not that. I'm not attacking people that are concerned about the environment. What I'm attacking is the false foundation upon which many of these ideas are built. And this is the false foundation. The false foundation, which is a synonym for a lie, is this, that we are desperately running out of power, food, resources, good climate, oil, energy. Okay? That, that's, that's a lie. Okay? We're not running out of any of that. That is a lie produced by a lack of truth and a lack of knowledge. Knowledge is power. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Nikola Tesla discovered this in the 1800s and the early in the 1900s. Tesla energy is, is quite, I'm going to summarize it, scalar technology discovered by Nikola Tesla. He, he, dis, he harnessed, discovered, and proved that if you want unlimited energy and power, which is what runs our world, it makes our world sustainable. If you're looking for oil, if you're looking for fracking and windmills and all this other stuff, it's a fool's errand because all of those things are not sustainable. You're going to run out. So what Tesla did is he developed very inexpensive technology that allowed Tesla with scalar technology to move through the physical dimension, reach in to what he called the ether, 
or the, the scalar realm. And what Tesla did was, for lack of better terms, is instead of drilling for an oil well, metaphorically, Tesla drilled into another dimension. And Tesla discovered that there exists multiple dimensions, which is a proven scientific fact. Tesla discovered that there were multiple dimensions, and Tesla discovered and proved that unlimited energy, unlimited power, unlimited energy can be pulled out of another dimension and pulled into the earth. And this unlimited energy, Tesla technology, scalar technology, can pull an infinite, notice the word is infinite, it's without end. We have the science now, we had the science in the 1800s, to pull infinite energy out of another dimension, and this infinite energy is so, supplies mankind with infinite and an endless supply of energy because it's energy that's being transported by inexpensive technology from another dimension, and it can power every house, every factory, every car, every need that mankind has for energy in order to have a sustainable planet, in order to change the weather. Because yes, I'm sure you figured out by now, I hope, for, I hope you have for crying out loud, that, that we have had um, weather modification technology um, since before the 1940s. I document that and I prove that in my book bundles, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Conquering the Matrix, and the other ones. In fact, in Conquering the Matrix, I have a speech given by the former head of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, where he lectures the Council on Foreign Relations and he talks about the reality of operable weather modification technology and how we have been successfully using it to change the weather for over 40 years. It's a recorded speech that I watched at the Council on Foreign Relations. This is the former head of the CIA. So if you're walking around in, in the ozone, okay, and if you're clueless and you have a wind tunnel for a brain, you're going to think, oh, it's not sustainable. We're running out of energy. That's horse, you know what. That's baloney. The, the former head of the CIA, he said, now, we, we, we're, we're, we are using weather modification technology to prevent climate change. That's what he said. Well, maybe he is. Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. But the point is, he openly admitted the reality, the viability, and the fact that we're, we've been using weather modification technology since at least the 1940s. You think all these tsunami, tsunamis, earthquakes, weird weather and all that stuff, you think it's just weird weather? You think it's weird weather because you have not paid the price to educate yourself. It costs. Okay. Educating yourself is free, but you have to have the willpower to self-educate what is the most powerful methodology of self-education? It's called reading a book. How many Christians read a book besides the Bible in a year? Practically none. Therefore, they're impotent in spiritual warfare. God chose the technology of the Word and a book to communicate everything he wanted us to know. Jesus is the Word become flesh. So if God chose the Word of God to communicate everything he knows, don't you think God knows something about communicating knowledge through the Word of God, the written Word of God, which then is produced in the form of a book, a written book? And by the way, putting it in the form of, of a written book goes way back to ancient Israel and Egypt when the ancient Israeli scribes would hand write all the words in Hebrew of what the Word of God said. God could have used any methodology he wanted to communicate. He chose the Word. He chose a book. Get a clue. 
There's no virtue in being a fool, by the way. Did you know that? There's no virtue in being a fool. The Church of Jesus Christ, I'm not putting down the Church, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, but the Church of Jesus Christ globally and nationally, not all, there are many exceptions, but the normative Christian in the eyes of the world is considered a fool, not to be taken seriously. Why? Because knowledge is power, the truth shall set you free. Read the book of Proverbs. Over and over again, God says, get wisdom, get knowledge, get understanding, get guidance. And that's repeated over and over. You need money, you need to pray, you need to work. But God's word says that he gives his people the power to get wealth. I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel. I'm not talking about Rolls, Rolls Royces and jumbo jets. I'm talking about for what you need to accomplish your purpose and mission in, in life. God gives people the power to get wealth. He gave that to Solomon. But notice that there was a condition to God giving Solomon the supernatural power to get wealth. That condition was that his heart was right. He was in synchronization. He was in frequency with God. He asked God for wisdom that he might lead the people of God correctly. And because of the purity of his motive, that's resonating true, okay? Because he asked correctly, God gave him the power to generate wealth, and he was the wealthiest man who ever lived. And he was the wisest man who ever lived. Now, I want to read you this verse here, okay? And you got to own the Word of God, man. If you're playing with the Word of God, then let me have a suggestion for you. Go get a tricycle. It's sustainable. It's not battery-powered. Throw in your car keys or your bus ticket and get a tricycle. And 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 ride your little tricycle in a circle as an adult. That would be a pathetic scenario, wouldn't it? For an adult to ride a tricycle? That's what most Christians do with the Word of God. They ride a tricycle endlessly around in a circle because they refuse. They're stiff-necked. They're hard-hearted. They rebel against the Word of God. All the while, Jesus died on the cross to set you free from all kinds of bondage. I want to read you something from the book of Ephesus. This is, this is like spiritual power, quantum mechanics, multidimensional warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, the whole armor of God. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What that is saying is that your ability to accomplish any goal, goal, your ability to defeat your adversaries or enemies, is not based on your fleshly power, your age, your willpower. Your power is not based on what you generate. Got it? Your power is based how much power and wisdom and ability the Lord gives you is not based on, on your willpower, your guts, your kutzpah, whatever. It says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Real power is the supernatural power of God. It's being clothed with power from on high, which comes from the word dunamis or dynamite, the explosive force or power of God. Not willpower. Faith in God's power. Be strong in the Lord. So you and I, to win the battle for our nation, to win, win the battle for the gospel, to win the battle to fulfill God's prophetic destiny for your life, your children's life, and our nation's life, and other nations' life, is all contingent on your willingness to be like a little child and receive from the Lord the supernatural strength from the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not your might, not my might, not worldly power. 
We're to be strong in the Lord and the power of God's might. There's a secret in there. Put on the whole armor of God. This is a spiritual armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil means the strategies, the schemes, the mind control, the hypnotic programming, the scientific mind control, the Luciferian forces. I expose them in my book, Conquering the Matrix. You're not, so, you're not supposed to be a dummy who gets sucker punched morning, noon, and night. You're supposed to be putting on the whole armor of God. So you can stand victoriously against the schemes, strategies, lies, deceptions of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle or fight against flesh and blood. So God is telling us flat out, our battle isn't with the people in the streets. Our battle ultimately is not with the billionaires financing them. Our battle isn't with this person or that person. Our battle is not against human beings. It says right here, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood or people. Our, what we're fighting, it says right here, is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're not fighting people. We're fighting spirits of deception, principality. What this is, is a hierarchical ranking of Lucifer or Satan's army. It consists of fallen angels of different rankings. Okay? So we're fighting not against people, but against principalities and powers. These are high-level demonic forces. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Fallen angels, demons, familiar spirits, um, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places, spiritual hosts of wickedness means armies in the invisible realm, Satan's armies in the invisible realm, who territorially occupy and come from. The invisible realm, the um, um, parallel universe, or the spiritual world. Multi-dimensional warfare. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. So you can't win a multi-dimensional battle or warfare without understanding how to use weapons, spiritual weapons, that are designed to be effective in the invisible realm, spiritual realm, or parallel universe. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That means the whole armor of God. You don't leave half of it on the floor. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. In other words, whatever comes against you, you can defeat nationally, globally, locally, personally, in your family. Wherever the battlefield is, you are an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror because you're tapping in to the weapons of our warfare that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That you may be able to withstand in the evil done, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, and then it talks about the full armor of God. And then it says in verse 18, praying. With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication um, for all the saints. So you're supposed to pray for all the saints, every brother and sister in Jesus Christ. You know, there's there's a time to in 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 the spirit of love and humility to correct a brother in, or sister in Christ who's walking in spiritual deception or apostasy, apostasy, et cetera, et cetera. There's a time and place for that. But it has to be done. Look, you're either in sync with God, and I'm using the metaphor of a multidimensional electromagnetic frequency. When you're resonating at the proper frequency, 
you you produce the results you want. When you're not, you're producing death force. So, as a believer in Christ, if you're going to correct or rebuke or challenge whoever or whatever for apostasy, deception, whatever, what, what's the rule? You just don't go off like, like you know, some drunken cowboy in a saloon. He's so drunk, he ends up shooting everybody, all his friends, and leaving the enemy standing there. God didn't call you to be a drunken cowboy or a drunken cowgirl. He didn't call you to do that. The rule in 1 John, and this is how we enter. You want to see power from on high? You want to see... um, uh, you want to be clothed with power from on high? Dunamis, the dynamite power of God? You come together as one. You can only come together as one. Not false ecumenical uh, perversion of theology. You, you, you unite under the belief of God's word as the final authority. And in that, in that proper biblical unification, Power from on high comes down, just like in the book of Acts. But here's, here's the critical thing. In 1 John, and if we don't have this, we have nothing. Believe me. That's why so many Christian efforts are impotent. Okay. Over and over again in 1 John, first of all, God tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. So if I'm communicating truth, my motivation, the energy behind the the truth that I'm speaking must be the agape love of Jesus Christ. If I'm speaking truth, but it's in hatred or pride or anger, I'm a clanging bell. I'm an annoying noise. I'm like screeching on a blackboard. God has commanded us to speak the truth in love. That's speaking the truth in love to the secular world and inside the Christian world. We have to speak the truth in love. That produces results. And as believers in Jesus Christ, it says over and over again in the Bible, and especially 1 John, we're to love one another as Christ loved the church. So repetitively, God tells us to love one another as Christ love the church. So when we interact, if the world does not see the demonstration of our truly loving one another, our words become impotent. God is love. God commands us in the body of Christ to love one another. To lo- love is long suffering. We've seen the description of love in the Bible. We're to love one another. And we are to speak the truth in love. It says that over and over again. Um, Let's just leave it at that. Because in 1 John, it talks about combating spiritual deception and demonic powers, etc., etc., the spirit of truth. The spirit of love tests the spirits, the spirit of Antichrist. But it also talks about in 1 John what's called the imperative or the priority of love. And this is critical. We are to love one another. So, that will save that for more. This is Paul McGuire. You've been listening to the Paul McGuire Prophetic Emergency Alert. I believe that the truth of God's word infused with the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, infused with the love of God and the truth of God's word. Bottom line, God has called you and I for such a time as this. The supernatural body of Christ, if it chooses to walk in supernatural love, supernatural wisdom, if it chooses to line up with God, God has given us the power to flatten the chaos, the hatred, the racism, the confusion, the riots, 
we have been given authority by Jesus Christ. We've been given the keys of the kingdom to bring down the satanic strongholds that are energizing the chaos and the death force in our cities and nations and lives. The body of Christ in America has been given the supernatural power to rule and reign from heavenly places over what's happening. God has also given us the supernatural power to call upon him, and we can fully expect that if we will call upon Jesus in the manner that he teaches us to, by coming boldly to the throne of grace, to find an ever-present help in time of need, <clears throat> through the blood of Jesus, you and I can go boldly into the throne room of God and ask Jesus Christ to rise from his throne. And we have the privilege of asking Jesus Christ to supernaturally intervene in everything that's happening in our own personal lives, our nation in crisis. We can fully expect, listen to me, the coronavirus is nothing. Let's stop magnifying in our hearts and minds the coronavirus. No, don't get me wrong. The coronavirus is real. The coronavirus needs to be respected as a formidable enemy. Scientific, medical, and practical things need to be done to protect us from that, including building up your immune system. However, what was paralyzing the armies of Israel from defeating their coronavirus? What, what was an example of uh, Israel's coronavirus? Goliath. When Goliath came on the battlefield, Goliath was a giant, and he mocked, and he ridiculed, and he defied the mighty men of Israel, the armies of Israel, just like the coronavirus is mocking the church and the chaos and communist Marxist agents are mocking the church in our cities. What happened? What was the turning point there? What caused defeat to turn into victory? King David, who was synced up with God. He was in a right relationship with God. And what did King David do? He received ridicule from his brothers. But David, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, in synchronization with God, David walked into the very hottest central focus point of the battlefield. David looked directly into the eyes of Goliath, as you and I should look at the coronavirus or these other enemies to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And David looked into Goliath's eyes and said, how dare you defy the armies of the living God? Then David took the weapon, the spiritual weapon and physical weapon that God told him to use. David didn't just grab weapons and go berserk on the battlefield. David was operating under the direction and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And David <clears throat> took his slingshot and one stone under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he hurled that stone, which landed right in, David's, uh, right in Goliath's forehead. Goliath drops to the ground dead. That's it. The battle is over in the visible realm and in the invisible realm. The armies behind Goliath, who were drooling to massacre the armies of Israel, saw their champion, Goliath, drop to the ground dead. And they fleed for their lives. They ran for the hills in terror. What happened? What happened? There was a reconfiguration of reality. There was a reframing of reality. David stepped into kingdom authority and exercised the dominion that God gave him as a priest and as a king before the Most High God. You and I were called for such a time as this. And what that means in practical terms is this. Once again, we are right now in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. And for our nation, we're in the greatest battle that we've ever been in. 
What lies before us is a doorway into the future. In fact, two doorways into the future lie before us. One doorway into the future will lead to a communist-style, Marxist-style, national socialist-style, totalitarian regime where we lose all our freedoms, where concentration camps, re-education camps, <clears throat> mass murders, starvation, and the brutal boots of oppression stamp out life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, where it stamps out freedom of religion, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of speech. That's one doorway into the future. And it's not determined by fatalism. It's determined by the choice of God's people. That means you right now. That means me right now. And the other doorway into the future, which we choose to walk through or not to walk through, is the doorway into the future that God planned for before the beginning of time. He has a prophetic destiny for America, a prophetic destiny for other nations in the world, a prophetic destiny for your life and your children's life and people you know, a prophetic destiny for your church, a prophetic destiny for America. And in God's prophetic destiny or call upon America, you, me, and other nations, the reason God has a prophetic destiny is because God's word tells us that Jesus Christ is returning soon. And because God is love, his heart is bursting with infinite compassion and love for his creation. Billions of men and women born on planet Earth. And it is God's highest desire above everything to bring every single little boy and girl, every baby in the womb, every man or woman, no matter how old they are. It's God's overwhelming desire to save every one of those people through the gospel of Jesus Christ by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, to take the penalty for our sins. And we will be cleansed of those sins and born again if we put our faith in Jesus. But the problem is we're in, a, in this great battle for the hearts and minds of mankind. And what it comes down to is this. This battle is raging in the hearts and minds of people everywhere. And it's a battle of ideas. It's a battle of beliefs. It's a battle of deception versus truth. It's a, ba it's a battle between you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It's a battle between, literally, the bottom line of the bottom line of reality is in the Word of God. It's a battle, an all-out war, between a spiritual war, between the forces of Lucifer, his fallen angels, and the men and women who choose to serve Lucifer and all those who, re who will receive the mark of the beast. It's a battle between evil, Lucifer, Satan, and the biblical God and Jesus Christ and the angels that choose to follow God and the people who are born again and the people of God. And the way this battle is conducted is through spiritual weapons, like we said. But this also involves we must proclaim the gospel. We must plant the seeds of God's word in the hearts and minds of men and women everywhere. How do we do this? We use every single means of communication available that God has given us. We use everything. Every technology, every method of communication and persuasion to win the hearts and minds of people. So I'm asking you once again, as a watchman on the wall blowing the trumpet, I need your help like never before. Not for me, for winning hearts and souls into the kingdom of God. I need an army, of a spiritual army of prayer warriors, people who are fasting, praying, 
interceding, engaging in prayer warfare on my behalf, my family's behalf, and the, the, the ministry of Paradise Mountain Church. I need people who will have a burden from God, not just like, ah, oh, maybe I feel like doing it, maybe I don't. People who have a burden, for, do you have a burden for God? from God? Then spread the message. Look, you know this is true. Just the other day, I won't get into that right now, but there's an all-out war against truth being waged, an all-out war against the Bible, against Jesus, against biblical values. An all-out war is being waged by the evil big tech companies. They're not these nice guys. Guess, guess who funds them? They don't operate on a normal uh, business. All the big tech companies, all the social media companies, all the networks, radio, television networks. Did you ever notice they don't operate on a basic business model that a pizza place owner would operate on or a restaurant owner would operate on or, or any other kind of job or business operates on? They all operate on profit and loss. How is it that all these big tech giants and communications giants can offend, insult, belittle, persecute, demean Christianity, biblical values, and Christians, and yet continue to stay in business? In other words, the basic business model and I've been in all facets of the communications, entertainment, media industry. I've worked in both secular and Christian. You have to have advertisers for the most part. And if you insult the people and belittle the people that your advertisers are trying to sell their products and services to, that do it doesn't work. People don't buy ads or products and services on networks, on social media, and other things that insult them and rip to shreds their Christian belief system. They don't buy from them. Anybody in business knows that. If you treat your customers like dirt, insult them, belittle them, make fun of their Christian religion, your business, whether it's a restaurant, a hair salon, whatever, you're going to go bankrupt. And you deserve to go bankrupt because you're so busy insulting and attacking your, your customer base. Nobody does that except the media giants. They do it every day. They do it every day. The social media giants, radio, television, satellite, what you see on your cell phone, they're insulting you, tearing apart your religion, shoving the occult and immorality in your face, and so on and so forth. And yet, Mysteriously, all these giant corporations manage to stay in business and make a profit, basically, year after year after year, while simultaneously insulting and attacking their customers' beliefs. How could that possibly be? That business model doesn't work anywhere, any place on planet Earth. It's because and this is where I need your help. I'm serious, man. If we, don't, if we don't win this battle now, it's over. Kiss America goodbye. And, and welcome, I'm welcome to, what was it, Stalag 17, the, the prison camp. The reason all these giant corporations in the media can continue to stay in business, continue to produce profits, while at the same time doing everything they can to attack their customers and insult them, is because, this is the secret I expose in my books, their real cash flow, the cash flow, the monies, and the so-called sales that are being made by all these media companies are not based on the standard business model, where you treat your customers right, you have a good product at a fair price, and the, the company's rewarded by the, the, your potential customers buying from you. Their business mo model runs like this. They'll do everything they can to demean, insult, attack, belittle your religion, your beliefs, your political viewpoint, 
and yet they still make a profit. Why is that? This is why. They have a secret source of funding that that exists outside of the traditional business model. Somebody very, very powerful is funneling billions of dollars into these companies so it looks like they're profitable and doing well. And and the way they play this game is you you have difficulty finding out who's secretly financing and putting all these companies into a profitable position because they use independent contractor companies. Let me give you an example. Amazon. Who gave Amazon hundreds and hundreds and millions of dollars to build a cloud system for one of the biggest intelligence agencies in the United States. Now, what was that about? And then, and then Jeff Bezos of Amazon goes out and buys the Washington uh, Post, a propaganda hit piece. And Jeff Bezos of Amazon goes out and buys, um, I think it was the New York Times, it was some other big uh, media conglomerate. So on paper, it looks like Amazon is making a huge profit because giant entities operating through intermediary companies are spending hundreds of millions and billions of dollars to make these companies look like they're profitable. But they're being artificially propped up. As long as they promote the globalist agenda, they're going to receive secretly billions of dollars. See how the game is played? And all I'm asking you, it's not much, I'm asking you to help me do an end run around the evil big tech censorship because they're shutting down every legitimate conservative and Christian voice and it's getting more intense every single day. Just the other day, YouTube shut down. Um, you used to be able to receive YouTubes from all kinds of ministries and organizations that would give you an alternative point of view or, or a Christian point of view no longer. You'll notice that you will no longer be receiving uh, mass uh, mailing through the internet of independent produced YouTubes. They stopped it. Why did they stop it? Because it's a couple of weeks or very soon to election time. That's why they stopped it. The censorship is outrageous. It's just like out of George Orwell. So I need your help. If you don't spread the messages we put out on your own, send them out far and wide. If you don't spread them, they will die like seeds on the ground. And not just, I'm not asking just on my behalf, any ministry you like, any organization that you feel is trustworthy, and I'm not talking about the fake news. Um, if you don't spread their videos and their messages and their audios and their social media, if you don't independently spread it yourself by emailing and and sending the links to to videos and articles and audios that you believe in, they'll die. Okay, and they keep making it harder and harder to to have a free press and freedom of speech. So I need your help in spreading this message far and wide. And then finally, all wars. The bigger the war, the more money it costs to finance a war. I'm not talking about a physical war. I'm talking about a spiritual war. Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church, we are right now at this second, we have numerous projects in motion. Feature films, documentary films, expansion, and the creation of a new network, uh, platforms that will send out our audio and video and other people's audio and video, and defeat the censorship. We need uh, to upgrade computer equipment. We need to uh, buy new uh, broadcasting uh, platforms because they're stealing the platforms. Look at how the game's being played. You just got three 
globalist corporations that control all the media in the United States. And they all say the same thing, including your so-called favorite conservative network. You better watch that conservative news network. They aren't who they used to be a month ago, six months ago, or a year ago. In fact, every week they become more and more in your face attacking your belief structure. Oh yeah, they'll they'll dangle some Hannity's and some Judge Janine's and some Tucker Carlson's and stuff in your face to make you feel good. But watch carefully what's going on at that network. The the lesser popular uh, news journalists, no, they're not journalists. The lesser popular news personalities are all on the attack mode of conservative and Christian values. We need your help. I need your help. I'm here to win, man. I'm not here to win for my ego. Okay? I'm not here to win to d- drive an expensive car. Okay? I'm not, I'm, I'm not, that's not, I'm, I'm not in it for the fame. You, you think there's, there's glory and fame being a Christian minister? What are you kidding me? All I do is get attacked for being a Christian minister. I'm serious. I have many of you who support me. Thank God. But the vast majority of, of what I get is attack, 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 24-7. But I'm not stopping. Come hell or high water. In Jesus' name. But I need your help financially. And if you think, if you don't want to help me, well then fine. All I'm asking you to do is pray to God. Ask God how you can contribute financially to this ministry. What, what size of a donation, how often you should make a donation. And if you don't feel led to, to give here, then find somebody else that you believe in your heart of hearts is being effective and donate to them. But man, I'm telling you, if, if it's just for the sake of your own survival, you better get on the job, baby. Sorry for the vernacular. You better get on the job because they are coming to steal your freedoms. And if you read my books and the documentation of every Marxist totalitarian takeover, Venezuela, Cuba, Russia, whatever you, you want to call it, they're coming for you. You think they're not coming for you? I'm telling you, they're going to burn your churches. Tragically, there will be bullets fired. There will be camps built. And if you're not totally politically correct, if you don't say this word or that way, this word, if you don't do this and that, They'll send you to a re-education camp, a concentration camp, and finally, they'll kill you. You think that's far-fetched? You think that's an extremist uh, conspiracy theory? It's not. Look at history. The Jews could not bring themselves to believe it can't happen here, that they would be rounded up, gassed to death in the concentration camps, and their bodies burnt alive in the concentration camp ovens. They couldn't believe it was going to happen. But it's happening here. We can stop it. We can turn it around. But we have to do a radical change. You got to look in your heart and say, Am I willing to sacrifice something for crying out loud so that my children and grandchildren can have a future worth living in if the Lord tarries? And let's turn this nation around. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Why don't you go there right now and donate something? Something. $10, $15, $50,000. The point is you're being obedient to the proclamation of the gospel. Our highest priority is saving souls. Visit paulmcguire.us. Spread this message far and wide. That's paulmcguire.us. 